Um, hi, I'm Amelia Crook. I work at the Australian Red Cross and I joined Red Cross about eight months ago to launch Traverse, uh, which is a digital verifiable credentials tool. And tonight in our time zone, I've got Kate helping us. Kate, give away. Uh, she is on the Traverse team. We're a small team, uh, but we have big ambitions and we're doing uh, a great job of getting Traverse out into the hands of people who need it. So uh, during this session, uh, please add questions into the chat and Kate will be collating those questions uh, so that we can ask them at the end. We'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Uh, so more than happy to answer any burning questions you have. Uh, welcome to everyone around the world. Um, it is tradition in Australia to do an acknowledgement of country to show respect to the Indigenous owners of our land. So before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the country on which I sit today by reading a poem by Australian poet Jonathan Hill. Today we stand in footsteps millennia old. May we acknowledge the traditional owners whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since men and women awoke from the great dream. We honour the presence of these ancestors who reside in the imagination of this land and whose irrepressible spirituality flows through all creation. And may that tr be true for the land you sit on as well. So we're here today to talk about Traverse. Thank you so much for joining. Let's kick off. Uh, let's get my screen in sync. There we go. So let's start with some research. Data from 697 not-for-profit organisations shows that a rise in competence and capability of staff and volunteers flows on to the creation of positive social impact. Now, it's really nice that research is saying this, but it feels really true, right? Like the more skilled an organisation's people are, the more likely they are to endeavour to deliver the mission of their organisation. So... I think this is true in the not-for-profit sector or where I'm from in a more commercial background. It's all about the people. It's always all about the people. And the more we can invest in the people in organisations that are aiming to do good, the better they'll be able to do that good. So how do we currently recognise the competence and capability of our workforce? Well, the answer really is inefficiently. Um, it's currently really expensive or difficult to verify the skills and training of a staff member or employee. And so if you, you've been through this process uh, where you apply for a role, you give your resume over, um, the organisation will call some references to have a chat about your skills. And if you've done some e-learning modules, then you probably uh, have a bunch of ticks next to your name in a centralised database somewhere. And for the big ticket items of training like university degrees, we tend to rely on large institutions as a proxy for trust. So we want to see that someone has a credential for the skills they say they have. And we've traditionally solved this problem with a piece of paper, which is like in this modern world just seems crazy, a transcript from a university. So let's uh, have a brief history lesson on look at how those transcripts have evolved. So they started out as ceremonial parchments. Uh, you were in a tribe and that tribe decided that you were really good at something uh, in the dark ages and they gave you a piece of sheepskin and you carried that around with pride because it showed that you could do something that the rest of the tribe maybe couldn't and that you had developed a skill that was useful and worthwhile to that tribe. Um, we then went through paper uh, I know that the Australian Red Cross used to spend uh, in their budget $100,000 a year on the gold leaf that would make that paper tamper-proof. Um, that budget item got cut quite a few years ago and now we have moved along to PDFs, um, which are not tamper-proof. Uh, you can, uh, they are susceptible to fraud um, and data breaches. So, then we moved on to centralised databases. You probably have one of these in your organisation right now where uh, your e-learning system has a bunch of ticks next to people's names to say that they've done the thing. But if another organisation wants to know about that, then that's 
one silo talking to another silo. The person in the middle finds it difficult to prove those skills. So the most recent evolution of the credential is to blockchain, um, which is sometimes called a trust machine. And it's called that because it's tamper-proof and it means no one can change the data that is written to the blockchain and no one entity controls it. Uh, so we like to think of it as a trust machine or a cooperation machine, because if you can suddenly trust what someone's saying, then that's a shortcut to cooperation, which is really interesting in our sector. And so what sits on the blockchain uh, in this um, example is a verifiable credential meaning when I share it, you can verify that it was written, what is written there is true, and you don't have to ask a third party like a university about whether I'm telling the truth or not. So Traverse is a verifiable credentials tool. That's what we've built, and it's built on blockchain. And verifiable credentials are the electronic equivalent of the physical credentials that we have today. So you've got your wallet with plastic cards in it, you've got your passport, driver's license, any qualifications you have or awards. Um, this just makes it digital, but trusted as well. So if we start to think about training and the evolution of this trusted technology, then the opportunity we face is actually quite exciting because it's the democratization of trusted credentials. Because we no longer have to rely on institutions like universities and their cent centralized databases as a proxy for trust. We can start to trust the person who can point to the skills they've acquired on the blockchain. And that means that training credentials just got a whole lot more democratic and interesting because more organisations can issue trusted credentials and then have them verified and useful within a new ecosystem of recognised knowledge. So there's a whole swathe of knowledge that exists in our sector that is not currently recognised or credentialed in any way. Uh, at best, you might get a Word document with a little certificate written into it. So what does it mean to have something that is trusted, that shows that you've completed work that previously you haven't been able to prove. Now let's talk for a moment about why verification is important. So trusted, uh, I've said trust a lot of times in this presentation already. And as we know, increasingly um, the digital world means that we can fake things. Um, and this is a fun example, which shows a new language of trust that we've developed. Uh, so on the left is a fake Barack Obama account, on the right is the real deal. And there's a few signals on here that we can see. So there's a blue tick next to his name. His handle is his full handle. There's a link that the other guy doesn't have. There's his birthday, which the other guy doesn't have. And he's got a whole bunch of followers, way more than this guy. So these are little signals that tell us that I'm more likely to trust the account on the right than the one on the left, even though they look very similar. And so what verifiable credentials offer is this new language of trust, similarly showing the things that you can trust and that are real against others, like a PDF that could be faked. Uh, we also know that, inter like this is quite a fun example with Barack Obama, but we know that in the aid sector, there are bad actors who will fake credentials and that puts them in front of vulnerable people. So it does become uh, very important to be able to verify someone's identity and the credentials that they have um, because it reduces the risk of employing or deploying staff and volunteers who are not skilled appropriately. Um, even in emergency services situations where you have volunteers going into dangerous uh, situations, you want to know they've got the skills to um, handle that, that emergency. Um, compliance teams love this, by the way, because it, it does help uh, reduce the risk of unskilled people being in vulnerable situations. So what happens if we can't verify skills, which is frankly what's happening now? Well, it, it's difficult and possibly risky to confidently mobilise staff and volunteers in an emergency, as I just said. Um, at a pr really practical level, it's less efficient. So staff and volunteers have to redo the same training they did in one organisation in another. 
If you've done child safeguarding training at Red Cross, it's likely that Oxfam's training is going to be similar. Um, could we find a way to recognise that training if we can prove that they've done it? And also there's just this really human thing that if you can't see it, you don't value it. So there is investment in training in the sector, in staff and volunteers, but it's pretty invisible and therefore not valued and not invested in. So the opportunity as we see it is to ask ourselves, how can we better encourage and recognise the develop, development of a more skilled workforce to enable greater social impact? If we go back to that first slide, showing that there's a really clear link between teams that have been developed and invested in, in training, have greater social impact, then what role can verifiable credentials play in order to create a more skilled workforce? <clears throat> So what we think is that uh, what verifiable credentials offer is the opportunity to make training more tangible and therefore meaningful to staff and volunteers and also provide pathways to future opportunities. We know that talking to a lot of volunteer managers that uh, many volunteers volunteer in order to help them get on a path to another role or another career or something else. And so not only are we helping them have impact in their volunteer role, but we're helping them set them up for a future career path as well. Same with staff. Um, and this really is about recognise the training you're already doing. I, I imagine many organisations are already investing in training. They're just not making it as tangible um, as they could. And making it tangible is encouraging more people to do that training. So. I know certainly in Australian Red Cross, we have a wonderful learning and development team who would love to encourage more people to do more training um, because they've made it available. <clears throat> so encouraging more people to do that training is something that's interesting to them. And then that proof of uh, training means that there's value beyond one organisation and that's a way to use those skills in the future. Also on the flip side, if another organisation is using Traverse and you're hiring, it means you can check that they've got those skills. So reduces inefficient inefficiencies in hiring as well. So throughout our research, um, we have found that verifiable credentials um, have flow on effects that we actually didn't expect. Um, we have seen research that shows that credentials drive greater engagement and learning and foster a greater connection to an organization's vision and values. This one's really interesting because this research came from IBM and they found that issuing credentials to people who had done IBM training courses made those people, <coughs> sorry. So again, made those people uh, more connected to the values and vision of IBM. Like where, that, that's fascinating to me because who has a connection to IBM? Um, but we work in an industry where that connection comes for free, right? But to um, engender that mission, particularly in volunteers, and really get them um, connected to the mission is a really great opportunity. Also deploying skilled staff and volunteers confidently. We know that many staff and volunteers in our sector are going into situations that are potentially risky. Um, and empowering the staff or volunteer with their credentials rather than ticking a box in a spreadsheet somewhere and then having to go and look up that spreadsheet means that you've got instant proof in the field that someone has the skills that they need. We have been speaking to the Community Fire Authority here in Australia uh, where, and they're the frontline defence against bushfires in Australia, which if you saw the news year before last, you know that's a big deal. And uh, they are really interested in Traverse because they have multiple brigades around the state, but those brigades don't, don't have shared access to that spreadsheet that has, you know, Joe Blobs has done this training. They happen to be at this brigade to help out, but they don't have that information to confidently put that person on a truck and go and help with the bushfire. So they are interested in Traverse to solve that problem. And then creating a new marketing channel. Um, you can share a Traverse credential on LinkedIn and any other social media platform, um, which gives people an opportunity to proudly display their achievement. But it's also a free marketing channel for the mission of the organisation. 
So yesterday uh, we had a someone share a credential that Red Cross had issued for internal training. And within two hours, she had 22 likes and six comments. And that's just like the tiniest example of what this means. It's a real opportunity to spread the word of your organization and also help people feel good about the work that they're doing. So how does Traverse work? I've said trust a lot. I've said verifiable credentials a lot. Let me uh, explain exactly what I mean. So you probably have a learning management system at the moment uh, or somewhere where all your onboarding training, your um, e-learning modules are. Um, even face-to-face -face training can be credentialed. We are working with the first aid team here in Australia to issue credentials for their first aid training. Um, so all it takes is a .csv file to come out of that system with the uh, name, email address, or phone number of the people that have completed the training. We upload that into Traverse, and then we issue credentials to the learner. So it's a pretty uh, simple process. Over time, we're looking at integrating into multiple learning management systems uh, to make that even easier. Um, you can also do that step yourself of um, just taking file from one system into Traverse. But at the moment, we're offering to do that for you, just to make it easier. So when the learner um, gets an email, just like this, saying they've completed their training, who that training was from, uh, a bit about Traverse and the opportunity to collect their certificate or credential, now this is where the blockchain magic comes in. Uh, they are prompted to download an app onto their device. Uh, that is because this isn't a email password situation in the cloud. It actually lives on your device, which is how the technology works. It means that we can uh, take the digital identity of the organization that has issued the credential and do a handshake with the device. And that is what's get, got, what gets written to the blockchain. So that, that is how the verification happens in the magic. It also means that the user isn't creating another email password account that they have to manage. Uh, and they then own that credential and can verify it with anyone. Uh, as you can see here, they can share with other organizations who may uh, want that if I've done my first aid training for work, then I can easily share that or I can share it on social media. And this is what it looks like. Uh, this is the uh, example I just gave of lovely Rebecca in the uh, training team at Red Cross Australia. And she shared this credential that she just got and all those people clapped her for it, which is nice. But you can do that on any platform. And when people click through on that link, they get all the information about that credential. So what uh, the prerequisites were for that um, particular piece of training, the evidence performance, the knowledge evidence, and the assessment conditions. And this is everything that you provide to us when we map the credential for you, which I'll get into in a minute. So this, uh, this is transparency, right? So this, the start of portability of people accepting other people's uh, credentials is that you can see what the credential is. At the moment, if you've just got a PDF with your name on it and someone's signature, that doesn't actually give you that much information. Whereas this shows exactly what you have earned and how. And then again, some blockchain magic, when you click the check status button, that's when we verify that this document is still valid uh, on the blockchain. So these green lights mean that it's all good, but if the expiration date had passed, for example, particularly relevant in first aid certificates, then it would be red. So not only is it managing uh, the tamper-proof nature of it, but it's also saying, well, it's no longer uh, valid, which um, is a really useful tool as well. So how do you start using Traverse? Well, let's start with what can be credentialed. Um, basically anything is the short answer, but uh, the things that we're finding the most useful are uh, credentials with existing standards like first aid, uh, where a registered training organization um, already has sort of done the work to um, 
make sure that the training is uh, nationally recognised. That's how it's termed in Australia, but I'm sure it's different around the world. Uh, so they're the things that are recognised across multiple sectors already. Then there's just common training that happens in many organisations but isn't nationally recognised. So child safeguarding happens everywhere. Um, diversity and inclusion, another one, fraud and corruption. These are things that are common throughout the sector but aren't often recognised. So you have to do it every time you move roles. And then there's organisation specific training. So at Australian Red Cross, we have a register, find, reunite operator uh, role and they have to do volunteer onboarding, which is a selection of training. And then they do specialised training for that role. So to uh, get a credential for that role means you've done, you know, 10 e-learning modules and a couple of face-to-faces and then you're ready to um, do good in that role. So that's another way to think about it. It doesn't have to be, you know, every e-learning module you get a credential because you'd get heaps, how to pick up a box credential, how to not do fraudulent transactions credential, that's a bit overkill, but uh, can we find ways to bundle credentials, which is another service that we offer. So all of these skills can now be digitally verified, meaning that they can be recognised and trusted within an organisation and over time across organisations. So this is how we're using it at Australian Red Cross. We're in the middle of rolling this out at the moment. <clears throat> Volunteer onboarding uh, is uh, one of the first ones we did. And that is all the basic training you need to sort of meet the bar and become a Red Cross volunteer. So you could go and work in a op shop or um, help out on, uh, in corporate volunteering. Um, if you were going to work in emergency services, then that means you need to do an extra level, level of training. And we're also looking at how we can credential those roles. External training that we offer, we are um, rolling that out uh, in the coming months. And then staff and volunteer training like the culture ladder, which I showed earlier, but we're also running leadership programs across the organization as I'm sure many um, national societies are um, and we're credentialing those to help make uh, those more sort of tangible and real and recognized across the organization. Um, we're also looking at programs and how could credentials be issued to many of our programs deliver training. Uh, we have, for example, um, modern slavery practices training where a train the trainer situation to help um, not-for-profits understand how to spot modern slavery practices. And that's a great thing to credentialize because train the trainers means that, um, that there is something like they've got the stamp of approval to go and deliver that course. Uh, and I'll come back to the Trust Alliance in a minute. So this is our website. You can go and visit it and um, have a poke around. Uh, it's a work in progress as we're learning what is um, resonating with people, but it does have lots of information on there and you can get in contact with us on there. And then uh, the big question is how much does it cost to use? Uh, well, the sort of history of this project is that it came out of the Humanitech team, which is part of the social innovation team here at Australian Red Cross. And the goal has been to set up a social enterprise um, to uh, both do good, but it's designed to support itself commercially in order to maintain its longevity and benefit in the sector. We know that projects come and go in the sector, programs have an end date, we really think there's an opportunity to be around for a long time. We're at the start of this wave of blockchain and verifiable credential rollout. And so we want to be able to pay for ourselves, wash our own faces, and any profits will be given back to um, share our profits with our full purpose customers. Uh, and in terms of pricing, this sector covers a wide range of organization types with different budgets and different countries. And we want to ensure we're being fair and equitable in our pricing. So we need to have a conversation to work that out. Also to be totally honest, we're at the start of our journey on this and um, we are looking for partners to come on board and work with us in sort of a mutual success way 
where we work together to make sure this product is meeting the needs of more, more than just Australian Red Cross, because we're, we're doing a good job of that, but we want to make it useful to more than just us. So how to get started using Traverse, having said all that, is it just email us <laughs> um, or contact us via our website. And then really it's a process of talking to you about your curriculum and the goals that you have for credentials. And then we'll help you map your training to credentials. So we've designed these credentials to be W3C compliant. W3C are the people that make the internet work basically. They agree the standards that mean that when you type HTTP into your browser that a website comes back, they have come up with standards for verifiable credentials. And so what that means in the long term is that all Traverse credentials will be interoperable with other systems. So when universities start issuing credentials, when um, governments start issuing credentials for your passport or your driver's license, you'll probably end up with a wallet on your phone where you keep all your credentials. And we're ensuring that we're building to those standards now so that over time, people don't have to download the Traverse wallet to claim their credential. They can just claim it into their government wallet or their preferred wallet over time. So we've got those standards. We can map your training to that credential and then we'll help you issue your first credentials, make sure it's all working for you um, and we can tweak things as we go. And then uh, we share the data to you, back to you about um, how Traverse is adding value to your organisation. So how many people claimed it, how many people shared it, uh, how many people viewed that share page. So you're starting to get real life information back at the other end of your training, which hasn't been possible with PDFs or Word certificates. So it's this lovely sort of uh, both tangible for the user, but also tangible for you because you start to see how people are interacting with those credentials. And then I also just wanted to make a note about the Trust Alliance. Uh, when this project started, it was recognised that building the technology is great and we should definitely do that. But the real big game here is around how do we get the sector to recognise each other's credentials? So that child safeguarding example, if I've done it at Red Cross, I don't want to have to do it at CARE as well. So we have gathered a bunch of NGOs and smaller not-for-profits together and have started the conversation about this very topic. How do we recognise each other's credentials and what does that mean and what does that look like? That's a long-term discussion. It's a new one for the sector and the Trust Alliance um, are gathering partners as we speak. I think they're up to 19 or 22 now. And the first credential they're looking at is child safeguarding and seeing if we can agree uh, portability and utility for that credential across these partners in Australia. And then what could that mean globally? So that's sort of a side project that has extra benefit but there's certainly also benefit in Traverse, using Traverse right now within your organisation. So that's it for the presentation. Um, I would love, I haven't been keeping track of the questions coming through. Yep. So Kate, can you? Of course, I've had some great questions coming in through via direct message to me. So thank you everyone. Um, one of the first questions we have for you, Amelia, is did you create this verifiable credential tool using blockchain in-house or did you have a partner? Ah, a bit of both, actually. We uh, used a partner agency called Type Human, uh, who are blockchain specialists, and we paid them to work with us to build the tool. Then when I joined the team eight months ago, I took ownership of the tool and have now built a team internally to take it forward. So I've hired the best developer that I've ever worked with. Um, Who's on the line? I'm not sure if you know. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't want to stop it, Erica. <laughs> That's nice. That's what gets said behind your back, Erica. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And Kate. Uh, Kate was actually on the Type Human team and we brought her across to Red Cross, uh, so I stole her. Yeah, so now Red Cross is building it from the ground up and uh, we sort of had a proof of concept and now we're scaling it. Uh, but our goal is to spin out and stand on, on our own two feet. Great. 
Um, I'm not sure if we can do this, but I want to acknowledge the question, which is around showing examples of credentials for emergency service volunteers and first aid training. Um, we can definitely do that uh, at a um, yeah, circulate can, them. Yeah, we can follow up and send you examples for sure. Yeah. I don't yeah. have all in front of me right now. So, but I just wanted to acknowledge the question. Um, the next one is how does it work with existing learning management systems? Yeah, we've been trying to get a gauge on which learning management systems are the most popular. So if, please let us know what you're using because ultimately we'd like to integrate and make it as simple as someone finishes the course, they immediately get a Traverse credential. Um, but at the moment it is um, export a CSV from your learning management, management system and upload it into Traverse to issue the credentials, which we've been doing um, a different points. So on one credential that we're doing, we get a daily report. On another, we're doing monthly reports. So it just depends on what cadence makes sense for that particular uh, training. Great. Thanks, Amelia. Uh, next question, which has come through is, may I ask if your blockchain is open source? Uh, Erica, do you want to answer that? It's, it's <laughs> Ethereum. Um, it sure, I can answer that one. Uh, so our, the actual application code is not currently open source, but we are using open source libraries to interact with Ethereum uh, blockchain. The blockchain itself uh, is public. You can see all of the data in public, uh, but we're also very careful that we don't ever show any information that would be considered personally identifiable there. Thanks so much, Erica. Um, Great, next, another question that's just come through is, have you thought of other use cases beyond learning credentials? For example, passports and identification. Yes, uh, actually that's where we started. Um, we were, the whole project started with a piece of research that showed that uh, volunteer, the nature of volunteering is changing. People want to volunteer across multiple organizations, maybe related to a cause that they're interested in rather than one organization. And one of the barriers to participation is all the checks you need to do. So working with tools and checks, police checks in order to get onboarded into organizations. So how could we remove that barrier and issue credentials so that people could verify that they've had those checks done across organizations? Really great idea. As we got into the detail of that, we found that existing government systems that are issuing those uh, checks, uh, we're working web three, they're firmly in web one. So very old clunky systems with that are by their very nature, heavily regulated, not open source um, and uh, costly to interact with. So uh, we looked at competitors who were doing um, work in this space and they've actually got around the problem by hiring humans to do the checks and then issuing the credentials. And as a small team, we weren't gonna spin up a whole team of humans to go global with every country's system. Uh, so we pivoted away from that to training credentials. But having said that, we are really excited about the potential for credentials um, in helping it, to be a bridge between existing government systems and um, people experiencing vulnerability. So we've been speaking to Services Australia, a department of our government, and they uh, are looking at credentials to issue to people once they've confirmed someone's identity. Um, if someone's just exiting the justice system, for example, they uh, don't have all the documents on them or they're fleeing domestic violence. The government currently has a process to uh, work out who they are and confirm their identity, but then they have to do that every time they interact with a new organization or government department. And that can be traumatic for them because they have to do it every time. So what if Services Australia could issue a credential? And that's just a bridge into systems like banks, like employers who can then say, okay, well, Services Australia has checked your identity. This is, an, this is enough for you to open a bank account, for example. So lots of potential uh, in the future as uh, verifiable credentials start um, the ecosystem starts working, but we're just not there yet. Great. 
Thanks, Amelia. And building on that question, we've got another one, which is around, have you shared this with banks? We have had a conversation with banks. Kate, do you want to take that question? <laughs> sure. So we have had some early conversations with banks that are really interested in how the collaboration with um, an organisation like Red Cross would work um, in helping particularly vulnerable people. So there is information within the banking system um, that has some assumptions around your identity. Um, and quite often that is what we call in Australia, like a four point check ID. And there are some sections of the bank for people with lived experience or experiencing vulnerability um, that have kind of a secondary system. But as Amelia mentioned before, they have to keep going through that over and over and again. So they see this tool as a really great way um, to credential that experience um, to remove that repetition. Um, and it was one of the big four providers in Australia. Um, so yeah. Um, I don't know if I missed anything in that conversation, but definitely something that they're interested in. And like any of those partnerships, um, engaging early so that when we're all ready, we can be on the best front foot. Yeah. And I'm actually managing the Q&A, so I need to go back to the list, sorry. <laughs> um, another question that's come through is, who can verify and accept these credentials? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. Um, so, a lot of verifiable credential systems are thinking about um, an issuer and a receiver. So a university issues the credential and then a bank as a, an employer accepts that credential and that the system needs to talk to each other. We've taken a bit of a different route on that in that um, not everyone yet has a digital identifier in their back pocket that they can whip out and um, just attach to their credential. And big systems aren't yet in place to consume credentials, even though the standards exist, they're not evenly distributed yet. So um, when I, I'll just go back a couple of screens. When someone shares a credential, either via email or on um, social media and people click through, it's just a link. And this is where you can verify the credential. So it's still up to the owner of that credential to share it. You can't just go to a URL and look up anyone's credentials. But once that has been shared, then it can be verified on the blockchain, which uh, doesn't need other systems. It's a very simple, elegant solution to get around the, pro the problem that not everybody is using verifiable credentials yet. Um, but it still means that you can verify them. Thanks, Amelia. A um, couple more, uh, can it be used for accredited training? Yes, it can be used for accredited training. Uh, so we are working, as I said, with the first aid team here in Australia, uh, Red Cross to issue credentials for accredited training. Um, really, it's just about the mapping exercise of taking the curriculum that is um, compliance um, ticked off by the government and translating that into a credential so it meets all the compliance requirements of the government. Um, and it's just such a safer way to issue credentials, particularly for accredited training, rather than a PDF that could be photoshopped quite easily. So it adds a lot of trust and value to um, accredited training. In fact, we've been talking to a volunteer database here in Victoria that got spun up quite quickly by the government um, when COVID hit last year. And they're looking at how they can get volunteers into the database with all their skills listed so that uh, they can be like a pool, a surge pool if they're ever needed again. And we're providing links to Traverse credentials in their system. And they were super excited because it just added this trust to our brand that if you've got a first aid credential and you can prove it in the system, then the, the risk of someone, you know, having an expired credential or having um, their husband's credential that they just put in or whatever um, is reduced greatly. So it's a really lovely fit for accredited training. Um, great. And I might call it at the last question here. 
Um, just to flag as well, I've had a few pricing inquiries come in and as Amelia flagged, we're working under a mutual success partnership model in the early stages. Being a, um, a company spun out from a non-for-profit, we have a deep understanding of the budget and constraint requirements. So um, I've asked those people who have reached out to me for their email so that we can have a better conversation. So just to acknowledge that that conversation is happening on the side. Uh, and last question that we'll take for the evening is, can you let me know how this compares to Credly used by universities? Great question. Great Peter. question. Love the person who asked that. You're our people, you get it. So Credly um, is a great solution. It is a centralized solution. Um, so it is one database and it means that you're using Credly uh, forever. Um, and that uh, it's not W3C compliant, meaning that you can move wallets. So it's fine. Um, it is a very web two model where um, the organization uses Credly to issue the credential. Um, the user then has a Credly credential and that will stay a Credly credential forever. Um, the model that we have, which is decentralized means that Yes, the organization has issued the credential, but it is then the user's credential and they can move it around wherever they want. It will be there forever because it's on the blockchain. They can prove it forever. And uh, yeah, it's theirs to own. So we, we took a humanity first approach to building this tool. So everything from the font we use to the product decisions we're making is all about who's gonna be using this and how do we protect their privacy? Because in this ever evolving world of data everywhere, we think it's important. And decentralized technology is a really nice match to that. So if you get a credential, it's yours. Um, and you don't need to rely on Credly to still be alive in 10 years in order to have access to it. Great, well, that is us at two minutes before. Um, thank you everyone for the great um, interaction on the Q&A. Yeah. That was really, really amazing. Um, Amelia, would you like to sign off? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to pop in the chat. Um, we have a survey that we would really love you to fill out. I can't find the chat. Kate, can you pop it in? Uh, yep. Can you send me the link quickly? Sorry, I couldn't find it before. Yes. Uh, so we've made a little form um, that we would love you to fill out just about why you're interested in Traverse. Does it solve a problem for you? If not, why not? That would be really helpful for us to know if you're sitting here thinking this is stupid, that's useful information. If you're thinking this is amazing, also useful information. So Kate's pop that in the chat and uh, it's like a two minute survey. It's not gonna take you long. It'd be really great insight for us. As I said, we're, we're building this for the sector. So the more feedback we get, the more information we get, the better this tool is going to be. And the more likely we are to get humanity first technology out in the market rather than a big greedy corporate trying to get more money. So uh, just thank you everyone for coming. It's been a pleasure. Um, I'm getting brighter and brighter as the sun goes down further and further. Apologies for that. Um, and we will uh, be in touch. Please reach out if you'd like to chat. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you all. <laughs>